Good morning, everyone. It's going to read a psalm here. God, be merciful to us and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations of the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Would you stand with me um, as we enter into a time of worship this morning? Um, a lot of these songs are focused on salvation and uh, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us. And it's just me this morning. Sorry about that, folks. But I thought it would be nice just to do something really simple. <laughs> Who else would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing. This joy is mine. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is for
God, we love you so much. We just are privileged to be in your presence this morning and to sing praise and worship to you. Washed in his blood. This 
Sometimes those old hymns, they just come to you and you remember all those words. Um, and it's good to be able to bring those up every now and then and be reminded of some really good, solid um, songs. Uh, this is a song that uh, Sandy introduced a few weeks ago, and so I um, thought we would run through it again. But the words of it are really powerful. Um, if you look at Psalm 97, uh, very similar words that talk about how our mountains or our fears, those things all come crashing down in sight of who God is. And I'm so thankful to serve a Savior that is bigger than the mountains that I have.
the battle is done. My God is stronger, the victory already won. Yeah, he died in my ransom and rose. Father, we acknowledge that today. We acknowledge that you are bigger, better, and stronger. Bigger, better, and stronger than any trial that we might face. You are bigger, you are better, and you are stronger than our enemy. And we remind the evil one of that today as we chase him out of here. For he doesn't worship you. He only comes to confuse your people. He only comes to irritate us, and we don't want him here today. So we cast him out. We cast him out in Jesus' name.
For our God is bigger. Our God is better. Our God is stronger. We put no faith in the enemy today. But we put all our faith in you, Jesus, knowing that you will get us through whatever the struggle, whatever the battle. Father, whether it's temptation, whether it's a trial of things that we didn't foresee coming, whether it's left us in a place of mourning, whether it's left us in a place of grieving, whatever it has done to us, we are reminded that you are bigger and better and stronger than all of this. And you will get us through. And we praise you for that. You're bigger and better and stronger than all our health issues today. And Lord, we have many as people living in a sinful world. But you're greater than all of that. And we know that you'll heal us from all these things. And Father, we look so forward to the day that we are with you in heaven. Oh, what a day of peace. What a day of rest that will be. And Father, would you give us a glimpse of that here on earth as we live this abundant life with you, Jesus? Would you give us a taste of that rest? A rest in Jesus. A rest in the one who is the Sabbath. A rest in you, Jesus. Father, your word says, come to me. Come to me, all ye who are heavy laden and burdened. And I will give you rest. And so, Lord, I pray that we would turn our face back to you and find our rest in you, Jesus. I pray that you would instill peace in our spirit today. I pray that your Holy Spirit will move in and crowd out anything that is not of you in our lives. Move in, Lord. Move in. Take up residence and push out all that is in us that we think we need that we don't. Lord, I pray that you would take up soul residence in our soul. And I pray that while you're in there, which is for all eternity, while we live this life here on earth, purge out of our soul that darkness. Purge out of our soul hate. Purge out of our soul bitterness. Purge out of our soul malice. Would you purge out of our soul the need that we think to seek revenge? purge it out. Purge out of our soul gossip. Purge it out of there, Lord. Jealousy. Get rid of it, Lord. And envy. Get rid of that. Father, do that work in us like only you can. Purge out of our soul loneliness. Remind us today that you have never forsaken us. You have never abandoned us. You have always been with us and you will always be with us forever and forever, for all eternity. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Family, it's good to be with you. Please be seated. And welcome to those who are visiting. I am Pastor Hines, for those that don't know me. And welcome to those who are listening in online today. Give them a shout out, would you? Say hello to them. Welcome to those who are listening in. Yeah, it is so good to be with you today. There's a few things that I, I want to bring to your attention. And, uh, you know, it, it's just a fantastic time of year. And uh, for those that weren't watching last night, the Oilers did advance to the second round. Yeah, which is a good thing. I kind of fell asleep and my uh, good wife Tammy said to me, you should have heard the crowds. They were going crazy. And so this is a, it's a big event for the Edmonton and greater area, right? And so it's good to celebrate. And that's the only reason I'm bringing that to your attention today is that we want to celebrate things. And so I hope that you can celebrate the weather. I hope that you can celebrate life. I hope that you can celebrate the fact that you're seeing uh, the trees blossom and bloom and all that. Isn't that wonderful? There's things to celebrate. There's things to be positive and encouraged about. And I hope that uh, you, can, you can be a part of that good stuff. I want us to remember a, a, a few people. And today I just want us to remember Mark and Renee. And so Mark and Renee are here with us today. And Renee's brother Kevin passed away here not long ago. And so they're mourning. They're mourning the loss of of him. And so they need to go back to uh, Saskatchewan in just a few weeks for the memorial. And I pray that you would lift them up in prayers. And would you reach out to them when God puts them on your heart to text, to call, just to be with them. Remember them. This is a hard time for them. Remember them. And we're praying for you. 
I want us to also remember Ron and Gloria. Would you stand? Last Saturday, I had the uh, privilege of marrying them. So, yeah. So, they're, yeah, that, that's fantastic. You stole that line from me, didn't you? <laughs> they're trusting love again. Is it wonderful to trust love again? Yes. Yeah. So, they're a testament that sometimes in life you get hurt and there is struggle and there's either separation or death or something that happens in a marriage but they're trusting love again. And so what a wonderful day it was to be with them last Saturday. Congratulations. Hey, this coming uh, June 20th, it's a Monday, and I don't know what you do with your Mondays, and some of you, maybe you work, and for others of you, maybe it's just kind of a blah day, but it's going to be an exciting day here at New Life Community Church as we have an evangelist team that's coming in from the United States to come to the Edmonton and greater area, and so they're starting in Calgary the week before, then they're coming into Edmonton, and from Edmonton, they go to Vancouver, from Vancouver, they go to Toronto, from Toronto, they go to Montreal, and so they're circulating in around some of the bigger areas of Canada, and the evangelist team is called uh, the Tommy Zito Evangelistic uh, Team, and so this is called the Canadian Awakening, and so I'm so excited to be a part of this. We get this group for one day, and that they would come to small town Stony Plain. That's only by the grace of God, amen? There was a lot of praying going on to get them to come here. There was a lot of people in prayer to, to have that happen. And so we're going to host them here at the church. And I'm going to be asking some of you to be a part of helping make meals and be hospitable and do these kinds of things. They have a team of 30, but only about half of them are going to be able to cross the border because Canada has some very, very tight COVID-19 protocols. And as you know, uh, the vax and unvax sort of polarizing issue is still out there in half of of them aren't vaccinated. And so our country says that, or our government says that you have to quarantine for two weeks. Well, by the time they get here and quarantine for two weeks, they'll have missed Calgary and they will have missed Edmonton. And so they're going to come with that team that are vaccinated and that's half of them. And uh, so I think 50% is better than nothing. What do you think? Absolutely, right? And it's going to be powerful. And so uh, Donna has been, Donna, would you raise your hand for everybody that doesn't know Donna? Donna works with me as the uh, admin assistant here at the church, and she does a lot more than that. She helps me in pastoral ministry. She does all kinds of stuff. And so right now she's building door hangers, and we're going to crank out anywhere from 500 to 1,000 of them. Remember back in the day we used to go around canvassing and knocking on doors and telling people about Jesus? We're going to we're going to actually do that again. And some of you haven't done that in years. Hey, it's been years, and that's going to be part of this evangelistic time. And we're going to ask you to be praying about this neighborhood. I want you to drive around. I want you to walk around. I want you to circulate your own neighborhoods where you live. And maybe we'll give you some door hangers, and you can simply go around and put them on the doors of, of your neighbor's houses, promoting the fact that we as a church are here. We're here, and we're here for the people. We're here for the neighborhood. And what you're going to see on those door hangers is all the things that the church offers, everything from counseling to, to services to, to you know, the evangelistic stuff that we're doing to discipleship and Sunday school and all that kind of stuff that we want to promote. And so I'm hoping that you're going to get on board with this. It's going to be fantastic. Are you excited? Yeah. It's one day but it's one day that's going to impact eternity. Yeah. Let's pray together. Father, we're excited about what's coming, but we're also excited about what's here today. And Lord, we thank you that you are with us, and that's what's here. We're not alone in this crusade. We're not alone in this journey. We're not alone in this thing called life. You were always with us right from the very beginning, the day that you called us into existence. You said to Isaiah, I knew you. I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. I knew you. And you knew us then and you know us better today. And Father, let me reinstate that. We know you better. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I'm moving into a uh, 
well, it looks like about a five-part series, but you know how that goes. Sometimes five moves into six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. It really depends on how far we get each Sunday. And so I'm excited to move into a sermon series in the book of First Peter. And that's where I'm going to ask you to turn today. First Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verses 3 to 12. And I've titled this message today, Trust, Grace, and and our hope. And so what is it that we trust in? What is this thing called grace? And what is our hope in is really what this sermon series is all about. And so Peter, he he deals with a congregation of Christians. Some were Jewish by descent and some were Gentile. They were in this Roman uh, sort of world that they were living in. And so they were coming to faith in Jesus by the thousands back in the day. The Bible tells us that Peter, not long after he denies Jesus, is then used in a mighty way to preach the gospel message after Christ descends into heaven and sends his Holy Spirit. And so his Holy Spirit entered into the life of, of, of Peter and he preaches this message where 3,000 people come to faith. Incredible. And I'm wondering if we're living in the days of that again in that first century Christianity sort of a feel where there are so many Canadians, there are so many people in our world today that don't know the Lord. They are lost souls to date as we know it. And can you imagine 3,000 coming to faith? Can you imagine 3,000 coming to our church after an evangelistic crusade? Where would we put them? What a wonderful problem that would be, right? An overflow issue. And I know that over COVID-19, there hasn't been an overflow issue, unfortunately. Most people have been skittish about being in congregations and gathering together it's been a challenge for for health reasons and so I'm not making light of that I'm just simply giving you the facts of what is and so Peter he's reaching to this congregation and he's encouraging them because when 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus you start recognizing what's going on out there in the world and guess what when you come to faith in Jesus you immediately get opposition When people start coming to churches and it starts to overflow because new people are coming to faith in Jesus, there begins to be opposition. And guess where that opposition comes from? The enemy. Because he's taking notice of what's going on and he's saying, I can't let that happen. If there's anything I can do to discourage that, he's going to try. And guess what they were doing back in first century Christianity? They were dealing with the discouragement And they were dealing with the hardship of coming to faith in Jesus. And Peter wants to encourage them. And so I want to encourage you today too. And some of the things that you're going to hear today, you're going to say, yeah, I've got in common with those people from back in the day. And other things you're going to say, no, that was more cultural. That was more of what they were dealing with then. But I can still glean something from that. And I hope today you'll take something from this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5 is where we start. And Peter says this to this congregation. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing beginning. Always praise God first. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish. It can never spoil. It will never fade. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you know what Peter is saying here? This covenant relationship that you enter into with Jesus is sealed, it is powerful. It is powerful. And you're going to go through times in your life that are going to feel like hell itself is burning at your heels. It is going to be so challenging. It is going to be so difficult. And God knew this. And Peter, he understood it because he lived it and he came to understand the love of God through all of this. And it didn't matter what hit him. He even denied Jesus that moment and Jesus forgave him. And the struggles that we go through in life and the struggles that they went through in their lives led them to believe that there is a living hope. 
And we are to put our troubles in God's hands, the one who is our living hope. And the scriptures tell us in that first five verses that there is an inheritance that is awaiting us. It will never perish. And we put our stock into so many things here on this side of heaven which oxidize, which rust, which, which mold away, which rot away, all these kinds of things. We purchase stuff and we buy things and I'm included in all of that. Trust me, I'm driving a car right now that's got rust. Why did it rust? Because it's living on this side of heaven. Well, and that car is really not living. I give it life, right? You give the things that you purchase and, and make life. But they rust and they rot and they oxidize and they fall apart and you always have to repair things. But your inheritance, your salvation, what God has done for you, it doesn't need to be repaired. You don't have to wax it. You don't have to shine it up. You don't have to wash it. It's not going to rust. It's not going to rot. It is preserved perfectly for you. And some of you think, oh, I've got to wait for it. Oh, I've got to wait for it. You don't. You don't. You can already be living the abundant life. And it's the abundant life that we live here on earth with our Lord Jesus that leads us to and reminds us that there is an eternity an inheritance that is waiting for us that will never spoil or fade. And this inheritance is kept by who? Who gives it life? Do you? No. The Holy Spirit, absolutely. God himself gives it life. He breathes life into it, just like you breathe some life into what you create. Some of you have created businesses, and if you weren't breathing life into it, there wouldn't be much there, right? Because no one loves your business like you love it. And God knew that and knew that none of us could breathe life into salvation because none of us could give it except for Jesus. And so he breathes life into that and he holds it for you. And through faith we are shielded by God's power. No matter what is going through our minds, no matter what we are dealing with in life today, you have a shielding over you. Everything that you have experienced that is painful, imagine it this way without that shielding, without the angels of God helping you through it. Do you know how hard that would be? We wouldn't be able to live. It would be that devastating. It would be that dark. But we are shielded, and we are shielded for what? We are shielded by the power of God for God to live with Him and for Him until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last times. And Peter encourages his audience which are going through tribulations and trials and hardships. Oh, they went through the fatigue of the body. They went through the aging process. <laughs> they went through the aches and pains. But you know what they went through that we're not having to go through? And I said some of what they dealt with is going to be a little different than what we deal with. The persecution of their faith. Many of us have experienced some of that to some degree. But them coming to faith in Jesus Christ meant severance from family, meant oster being ostracized in the community. People wouldn't look at them anymore. People would write them off and say that they don't exist. All that kind of stuff was happening in their lives. Many of us don't have to deal with that today. Yet. Yet. And he encourages his audience to stay faithful to stay faithful to Jesus even while facing unbelievable hardships and trials. So I say to you, church, stay faithful. Not to me. As much as you can to each other, humanly speaking, but stay faithful to God. And I say this to you today, that that day when you cannot stay faithful to God, He still remains faithful. Because you've entered into a covenant with him. And he will bring you back. He will keep you. And Peter goes on in verses 6 to 9 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter. And he says this to this audience. And, and I hope that you just allow this to just absorb into your spirit today. He said that in all of this you greatly rejoice. In all the trials, in other words. In all the suffering that you're going through. And you are going through some suffering, church. 
I know that you are. Some of you are waiting for jobs that don't ever seem to be coming. Some of you are waiting for children that don't ever seem to be born. Some of you are waiting for things in your businesses, in your lives, in your family units, in life where it just doesn't seem like it's happening. And he says, in all of this, rejoice, rejoice. And though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of troubles, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise to God, in glory and in honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Are you praising God when things don't work out the way you want it to? Are you still thanking God when things don't happen in your time? Or when a yes didn't look like that yes that you thought it would be? Or that no came and it was certainly a lot harder to have to take in than you ever thought it would be? Are you still praising Him? Verse 8 says, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Isn't that amazing? You haven't seen God and you love Him. Are we foolish? Like, what's the matter with us as Christians? Has anyone seen the face of God? We've experienced His Holy Spirit. Absolutely. I haven't seen the face of Jesus yet. We don't even know from Scripture what it looked like. There's some people in Texas that got Him looking blonde and blue eyes. There's some people in other parts of the world that fashion Him in their likeness. We don't know. We don't know. The Bible says that we can't look on the face of God, not yet, but we will. We will. We will when we're in our glorified bodies. And that's part of our inheritance. We will see the face of God and you will weep like a baby. And not because you're in anguish, but because you're in such ecstasy. <laughs> It'll be amazing. And we haven't seen him, says verse 8. But we love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him. And even though things haven't worked out in your life like you thought that they would, but you still believe in Him. You are people of great faith. Great faith. You are faithful people. You believe in Him. And you are filled because of it with an inexpressible and glorious joy that the world that doesn't know Jesus looks at you and says, you're a fool. And they have no idea this joy and why it's there. Because you've experienced the touch of God's Holy Spirit in your life. And it has pricked your spirit. It has awakened it. It has quickened it. And it is now ministering in your soul. The Holy Spirit is blessing you. And you are receiving the end result of your faith. The salvation of your souls. That's what's going on. Hey, there's my Canadian accent. Hey, I love it. That's what's going on. Our souls are being worked on. They are being made new as we speak. Each and every one of you, your spirit has been made new. It has been made perfect. And now your soul is being made new each and every day. And how does God do it? Through the trials and the struggles of life. Oh, but we get so upset with him sometimes for it. Why don't you give someone else some of that bad news every once in a while instead of me? You ever feel like you're getting just pounded with the negative? You're getting pounded with the struggles. You're taking a beating. You're like in this, this, this storm where the rain just doesn't ever want to end. Do you know why it's happening to you? If you're a genuine believer, it's because God is trusting you with it. And He is saying to you, as He said to His Son Jesus, be an example to those around you, of a person who can persevere through tremendous trial and still praise God. Oh, there's nothing better than me going into a hospital and seeing the severity and the pain in a person's body. And there they are, not talking about their pain, but praising God. That is a delight. I hope I can do that. 
I certainly hope I can do that. Now, there are times when we have to talk about our pain. And Tammy knows it because I whine a lot to her when I got the sniffles. But you know, the path to glory, to that glorified body that we'll once have, leads through opposition. We become stronger people through the struggles that we go through. And they're hard and they're hurtful. And they make us sad and there's sorrow all involved with it. But the path to glory leads through opposition. And perseverance, enduring hardship and suffering, it tests us as children of God. And it proves our faith is real. And as one popular commentary helps us understand, perseverance through trials and suffering is a part of our spiritual training. And he says this, The problem of suffering has always puzzled Christians. But the path to glory leads through this opposition. And so the struggles that you have in the workplace and the struggles that you have in your family units and the struggles that you have with your bodies and the struggles that you have in your mind and the struggles that you have in your heart and the things that you have to endure, they're all meant by God for good. And I know that we struggle to know how in the world can he mean what has just happened in my life for good. Yeah, there's tragedies that happen. But he's working on your soul. He's working on your heart. And I tell you today that suffering yields something. It yields something in our spiritual workout. The Apostle Peter, he commended his audience for having the ability to love one another. That's what it yields. That you still love people even though you're suffering. You still love people. You've never turned your back on people. And he says this is what they were commended for. They're going through hell on earth. That's what they were going through. And they still loved each other. They didn't become bitter, in other words. They became better. And we don't know in that moment of pain and suffering how we're ever going to become better. We don't. Because pain is a blocker. And it blocks the love of God that wants to come into our life. And it blocks the love of God's people that want to bless you when you're going through pain. It's a blocker. It just simply is. And these people like us today, they fought through trials of persecution. They fought through trials of hardship. But they fought through it with the help of God's people, with each other. And they fought through it with the work of the Holy Spirit that was actively working in their lives. And it yielded them a harvest of true faith in Jesus. And evidence of this faith was their genuine ability to love others as Christ loves us. That was the end result. And that is what God wants to see yield at the end of all the suffering that you go through. That you still love each other. That there's no hard feelings one toward another, nor toward God, for the life that you've had to live and the things that you've had to endure while living this life. And these people, they rejoiced with joy unspeakable. So how do we define this joy unspeakable in today's culture? Well, really, the only way I can put it is enemy, Satan, throw whatever you want at me. Take whomever you want from my life. Take all my possessions. Take all my loved ones. But you can't take my soul. You can't have it. It's being worked anew today. My spirit is already with God. (laughs) It's already died. And it is with God. And it is in me reminding my soul that it's working its salvation out. And so Satan can throw whatever he wants at us. We don't like it. We don't like it. But he can't have your soul. He goes on, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. I'm sure that these words were hard for Peter to write, but yet the people were rejoicing from it. He said, concerning this salvation that your soul is going through, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, they searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. 
Verse 12 says, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but they were serving you. And when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we have hope. We are not people who don't have hope. No matter what we go through, no matter the struggles, we are a people who have hope because God has given us an inheritance. He has a will, and guess what? You're invited to the day that he reads the will, and you know what? You get something. (laughs) You get something. He hasn't left you out of the will. (laughs) It's amazing. You know how many of you have gone to hear the wills read of people that you've loved? only to hear your name not called for anything. And you leave disappointed. Yeah, I've had loved ones not leave me a whole lot of anything. But I have a loved one who leaves me everything. And God has given himself in his entirety and has given me everything. And he has done the same for you. And the message of salvation that the Old Testament prophets foretold says the words, even angels, they long to look into these things, trying to understand the love of God and its magnitude and its majesty. And as one commentator describes helping us to understand, well, what does that mean, these angels looking into these things? It was like a miner searching for precious ore. A miner searching for precious ore. And that's what the angels were doing. And that's what the prophets of old were doing. And that's what many of us do. But the prophets were baffled the same way modern day Christians are with the idea of how time between the two periods of earthly sufferings and heavenly glory could be reconciled. How do we reconcile what we have gone through traumatically in our lives today with what's to come, this inter- the eternal inheritance? How do we reconcile that? We do it by trusting Jesus because He bridges our life here on earth with our life in heaven. He bridges it. There'll be things that go on in our lives that we won't ever have answers for, that we'll never understand. But trust Jesus. Trust Him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we have assurance today. We have assurance today of our eternal inheritance. And by faith, we believe. And Father, today some of us are struggling with faith. There's been things that have happened in our lives that have tested our faith. And we confess to you today that doubt has welled up. Doubt that says, well, maybe God is not as good as I thought he was. Maybe God isn't able to hold my salvation. Maybe there isn't anything waiting for me after all. Maybe I'm not written in the will. And Father, these are all the attacks of the enemy who wants to discourage us in believing that you can do anything for us. He wants to discredit your name. And we cast him out of our thinking today. We cast him out of our souls and we will not allow him to discourage us. We will go through the trials and the struggles that we have to. And we will praise you, God, even though it brings tears, even though it brings pain. We will praise you. We will praise you, Lord. And Father, I pray for anyone today that has doubt. And I pray today that you would put faith in place of doubt. So, Lord, I pray right now for those that are doubting that they would say this prayer. Father in heaven, I take this doubt 
that has formed inside my soul and I push it out and I ask that you would bring in your faith, your faith that would cause me to believe that everything that is said, that everything that is written in your word, the Bible, is true. And I will now worship you both in spirit and in this truth. And by the power of Jesus Christ and the working of His Holy Spirit, I will be made new. Strengthen my faith in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to close with a, a song of invitation. I don't know where you stand with the Lord or where